Educational Communications and this station present Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman. On this series, we explore the effects of human influence on the Earth's ecosystems and discuss solutions to environmental problems which affect the quality of life on this planet. Environmental Directions gives you the kind of information you need to help you participate in decisions impacting your community, the nation, and the world. Now, here's your host, Nancy Perlman. Hello. For the next half hour, we're going to be talking about population, especially about how overpopulation affects climate, affects war, affects species loss, and affects human rights, especially reproductive health care rights. With my guest, Dr. Richard Grossman. He is a medical doctor with a master's in public health. He has been a gynecologist for over 40 years, and he has been author of gynecologist column for Women's World and author of a column for Durango Herald, as well as being a blogger on populationmatters.org. He is also an advisor to the nonprofit organization Population Balance and is a member of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the Society of Family Planning, and Quaker Earth Care Witness, their population group. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much, Nancy. It's great to be here. You have been aware of the need to take care of the people on the planet, and consequently, you also believe that maybe we need to control the number of people on the planet so everybody can have a decent lifestyle. We're entering 8 billion people. Can the Earth really manage taking care of that many people? Probably we can manage at least for a short period of time. I'm concerned, though, that the sustainable population is somewhere around 3 billion or at the most 3.5, 4 billion. 2 billion would be more reasonable. So we're way over the sustainable global human population number. The carrying capacity means having enough water, food, resources that we need for living, for clothing, for housing, for all our activities. Resources on the planet are limited, aren't they? Unfortunately, yes. It would be great if we had unlimited resources. And that's the way we're acting, especially in this country. However, there are limitations. Being a physician, you have also seen the impacts of too many children on women, especially the fact that women are at risk of too many childbirths. Can you explain why that is of concern? Yes. Actually, the largest number, the highest parity that I've delivered a woman of was a woman having her... 12th child. She came to me requesting a cesarean section with this delivery. I never really asked her why, but she also wanted to get her tubes tied. She is a Catholic woman, and this was her second marriage. Her first husband was killed. I thought, oh, I wonder how this woman does with so many kids. Then after the baby was born, I was amazed and very pleased to see the support she had from her older kids. So I'm not critical of people with large numbers of kids. I feel that it's their right to have as many kids as they want. My feeling is that I should only help people limit their family size if that's what they want. Isn't it true, though, that many women in the world would like to have family planning because they don't have access to it. They have more kids than they would want. And when people realize that having fewer kids means that the kids they have will be fed, will be educated, will have a better chance in life. And yet the world seems to be reluctant in terms of providing that very human right to be able to control our own bodies and to manage our family. Exactly. Unfortunately, there are probably more than just the one reason that people don't access to good contraception. In many societies, especially the men, want larger families than can be supported. It's a sign of manhood to have eight, ten kids. The women are left taking care of the kids. You had alluded to the fact that higher parity, 
having more children can be harmful to a woman. Not only is it harmful to her body because childbirth is difficult and it causes problems with prolapse and other female problems, but also women are left with taking care of those kids. In some societies, the guys just hang around and drink and play checkers. Unfortunately, that's the way some societies are, including our own, but making available the way to control their fertility is certainly a step in the right direction. One of my favorite organizations is the Population Media Center. It works internationally and also in the USA in helping people realize the advantages not only of smaller family size, but also of other health changes. For instance, they have been very active in fighting female circumcision, female genital mutilation in places where that's common. I'm glad the term circumcision isn't really being used anymore because it is female genital mutilation. Yes. There's no purpose to doing that to a woman. Yes. Fortunately, I've never had to deal with a mutilated female, but there are those women who, even in this country, have their genitals mutilated because of their families or immigrants from other places where that's common. They've also fought child marriage, which is very common in parts of the developing world, but Population Media Center has supported education of girls and tried to decrease the incidence of child marriage in developing countries. What's interesting is that when young girls, women get an education, are allowed to participate in the political and social realm and not just be child bearers, that they are able to be more effective in providing for their families, for the community, and preserving and protecting their local environment. They don't have the same impact. They see the importance of limiting their children so that the children will have the land, the resources to feed, house, and clothe themselves, and be able to set aside land also for the wildlife and for the ecosystems to carry on in their natural way. There's a major correlation there that is so rarely explored and discussed and maintained. You said that very well. Drawdown talks, the famous book, talks about how empowering women with education is one of the most important things that we can do to help decrease our carbon dioxide emissions, therefore decrease the rate at which climate change is happening. As a gynecologist, you obviously have seen the need for family planning. You consider life sacred. You are concerned, though, about ovarian cancer. You are concerned about the current state of legislation that's outlawing abortions or the woman's right to choose between herself and her doctor what to do with her own body. That's exactly correct. First of all, let's talk about ovarian cancer. It's a terrible disease. I have a friend who's a poet, Pam Ustchek, who developed ovarian cancer, and I thought for sure she was going to die from it. It was stage three. Most of the women who have ovarian cancer in stage three or four die from the disease. She is fortunately, by the grace of God and the grace of the Mayo Clinic, still alive and well 10 years later. There's an amazing, relatively new finding, it's about 10 years old, that actually most ovarian cancer starts in the women's tubes. They're intimately related, the tube and the ovary, and apparently cancer cells from the tube stick to the ovary and, and cause most types of ovarian cancer. So instead of having their tubes tied, Many women are having their tubes excised, taken out completely. A total salpingectomy is easy to do, especially at the time of a cesarean section. And yet Catholic hospitals don't allow that very simple procedure because of the prohibition. I'll read from an essay I recently wrote. The Catholic hospitals have to abide by the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care 
services written by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. It says, direct sterilization of either men or women, whether permanent or temporary, is not permitted in the Catholic health care institution. Procedures that induce sterility are permitted when their direct effect is the cure or alleviation of a present or serious pathology and a simpler treatment is not available. Unfortunately, this statement has unintended consequences. Many women have hysterectomies in Catholic hospitals because it's simpler, safer, and less expensive tubal ligation is not allowed. Worse, this policy leads to unplanned pregnancies and to abortions. Remember, the most effective way of preventing abortions is by effective contraception. What's interesting is that you did work in a Catholic hospital, and yet you are more active in the Quaker community as a Quaker Earth Care witness in their population group. My father, a urologic surgeon, a Jew, worked in a Catholic hospital as well as public hospitals and other institutions. And yet the general public depends on the local hospital to take care of their needs. And shouldn't health care be available regardless of who's running the hospital? Definitely. So I have to say that the local Catholic hospital was very supportive of me and reproductive health care up until the point that I just read. Of course, they didn't allow abortions except to save the mother's life. That's fortunately a very rare occurrence. There's so much that needs to be done to make health care more accessible to everyone and for people to realize the importance of health in relationship to what's going on in the environment. You mentioned cancer. So many cancers are being caused by the toxics that we are exposed to every day in our environment. Do you think that the medical community is making these connections and trying to get more involved and trying to eliminate toxics? Because I know there are some places in the South that they even call them Cancer Alley. There's so many factories spewing so many toxics that people are getting too many cancers. So I belong to Physicians for Social Responsibility, and it's been a leader in trying to make people aware of Toxics. One of their campaigns is to electrify especially new homes. And the reason is that natural gas, although it is a relatively inexpensive source of energy and our house is primarily heated with natural gas, it has problems. A lot of the problems occur from fracking, from fracturing the ground beneath us and the chemicals that are used in fracking, but also in our homes. Natural gas causes problems. I grew up in a home in Philadelphia, relatively small home, small kitchen with a natural gas stove. We didn't have any ventilation other than opening the door and the windows of the kitchen. It's been found recently that kids who live in homes with gas stoves are much more likely to have asthma. And I grew up without asthma, but I've developed it since then. My sister, who was older than I, unfortunately had severe asthma. I only can guess what effect the gas stove had in causing that. And recently we heard of tourists dying in hotels and Airbnbs and other countries from carbon monoxide poisoning. So yeah. having proper ventilation is very critical. In fact, caring about our health and the environment is really connected. We're going to talk more about the impact of people on the environment when we return in a moment with my guest, Dr. Richard Grossman. Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman continues with further discussion of the world's critical ecological issues. For more information, you may call 310-559-9160 or go to www.ecoprojects.org. Now, here's Nancy. I'm speaking with Dr. Richard Grossman. He's a 
gynecologist and very active with numerous organizations concerned about population. Originally, you got involved with overpopulation as a problem because of its relationship to war. What is that connection? So I used to read as a kid the Scientific American, a great magazine. In 1960, the December issue carried an advertisement. What it basically said is that overpopulation will increase the risk of war. Is that because of the people fighting over resources, whether or not it's water, oil, trees, food? I'm not sure whether Putin is thinking about resources or just power over Ukraine, but that's our current war, which is perhaps caused by or contributed to by overpopulation and possibly because of Putin's wanting the resources that Ukraine offers. Let's talk also about the impact of overpopulation on species lost and on the loss of ecosystems. I'm very concerned about wildlife and have done a lot of work in East Africa and the wildlife there is absolutely fantastic, but it's important to help the local community to have education, health care, so that they don't don't kill the wildlife for money. And so they recognize that the wildlife need to exist and they need to exist. And there's a real correlation there in terms of more people than they go into the habitat of the wildlife. Fewer people, the wildlife and the people can both survive with a nice living. I agree with you. I have often said that human population is my head issue. But my heart issue is loss of species. Not only are we losing species to extinction, but also we're losing numbers of species. And more and more animals, invertebrate as well as vertebrate, are being reduced in numbers. This is especially noticeable with birds. When you authored the column, Gynecologist's column for Women's World, and also a column in Durango Herald, did the people who consulted you make a connection between the environment and their own health? Not that much, but certainly I wrote about our loss of species, the loss of biodiversity. You are still writing on a blog, www.population-matters.org. What concerns have you recently written about? So thank you for stressing that hyphen is necessary. If you don't put the hyphen in in just write populationmatters.org, you'll end up in England. And you're in Colorado. That's correct near Durango, Colorado. The current issues that I'm writing about are access to abortion care because our local hospital is not going to allow gynecologist obstetricians to do tubal ligations at the time of cesarean section. But all the world is connected. That's why as the human numbers and our consumption increase, the rest of the world is suffering. I've been following your work for decades. You're an advisor for Population Balance. This is an organization that recognizes the impact of people on the environment, people and their health. Are we finding that these kinds of concerns are being more accepted elsewhere in the world? Or have Americans finally recognized that the issue of numbers of people can have a major impact on both their personal health, their personal family, and that of our communities, our societies, and the broader picture of our wildlife and ecosystems. I think people are starting to wake up to what you just said, that they're realizing that we have more and more influence over non-human species, and also that the medications, the chemicals that we are exposed to have harmful effects, not only on us, but on other species. I'd like to mention the Center for Biological Diversity, which is based in Tucson, Arizona, but actually has offices all over the country. They're doing incredible legal work to protect wildlife in various habitats. Right. For all the environmental groups that I'm aware of in this country, they're the only environmental group that has any real population group. There's a group working on sustainability and population. Their flagship, if that's an appropriate term, movement is the endangered species.
species condoms. They give out to folks who are interested little boxes of these condoms that have funny sayings on the outside and then two normal usable condoms inside. That's certainly making a connection between endangered species and sex. Yes. Unfortunately, the statistic in our country is that about 48% of all pregnancies conceived in this country are unplanned, unintended. That's very high for an educated country. Right. The global figure is about 40%. So we're a little bit higher than the global number and much higher than most other highly developed countries. It's certainly time that we start making some changes, and that entails understanding the impact of individuals on the environment. It also means changing some attitudes. How do you change people's conceptions when their religion or spiritual beliefs don't encourage this connection? Because you mentioned some of the reasons that some people aren't involved in family planning. You're very active in the population group with the Quaker Earth Care Witness. What are they doing and how do they manage to have a religious belief that we have to care about our earth and care about how many people we have and support family planning? I was taught as a kid never talk about politics or religion at large gatherings like Thanksgiving. It's what drives most of us, many of us, Politics are important, as we've seen at the recent midterm election, and religion shapes so much of our beliefs and our actions. I once had a conversation by email with somebody who had a master's degree in conservation biology, the group of biologists that try to save endangered species, and she had no understanding that the cause of endangerment of species the reason that we're destroying species, sending them into extinction at a rate that's about a thousand or maybe 10,000 times normal is due to our humans taking over habitat, causing climate change, intoxifying the world, etc. These are all human causes of extinction. She had no understanding of that, and that was because of her religious beliefs. Do you think that the major religions will start recognizing the connections and the need to make changes? I have hopes, and indeed the birth rate is falling all over the world, including in the state where that woman was. So I think that there are positive signs. Unfortunately, the birth rate is not falling fast enough to preserve our environment. Most people who recognize the fact that this world has too many people for the resources recognize also that people are causing the climate crisis and chaos. And we have had COP27, an international gathering to discuss what to do about the climate crisis. Have they been making the connection between people and the need to protect reproductive health, women's rights, human rights, along with species rights to exist and all the other issues in terms of how we can change our lifestyle, our technology to be more conducive to not impacting the climate? I don't believe so. There have been connections made. There's a paper written by Brian O'Neill. It's several years old now, but he quantified, along with a group of other scientists, the effect of making family planning available to everybody, that it would cause a 37% decrease in the rate at which carbon dioxide is emitted. Somebody who was at COP27 said that there was essentially no attention being paid to human population and reproductive health as 
is a way of slowing climate change. Unfortunately, then they are ignoring some correlations that are so important. You mentioned the difficulty of talking about religion and politics, but politics is so relevant in terms of what is going on internationally. There was a time when the U.S. pulled out some of its funds to the International Population Fund to provide family planning around the world. Has that changed? My understanding is that it has been increased again by the current administration in Washington, but it's nowhere near enough. And one of the sad things is that the UNFPA, the Family Planning and Population Group at the United Nations, in their latest report, which came out this summer, said that $8 billion is fine, basically. They have not really paid attention to the problems caused by overpopulation. There are so many problems. As a medical doctor, you are still active with issues of public health. You worked as a gynecologist for over 40 years, continue to be involved in organizations, both medical and the environment. Do you find that more doctors are finally making the connection between what's going on in our environment and our health? It's difficult for me to to measure that. One of the great things that has happened since I graduated from medical school over 50 years ago is that there's now a group, a cadre of people who have been trained in family planning and abortion, and they, I think, spend two extra years after either a family practice residency or OBGYN residency, and they deal with difficult issues of family planning as well as providing abortion care. Religion has played such a role in how people decide what to do with family planning. What connection do you see? Before doing my residency specialty training in obstetrics and gynecology, I spent three years in a small town as a general practitioner. It was a very Catholic down. The priest actually grew up in Pennsylvania, close to where I grew up. So we had some in common and we became friends. But shortly after I was been in practice there, I was told by the women who worked in the clinic that the priest had talked against me. He had warned his parishioners not to come to the clinic because I talked to the women about family planning, about birth control pills. I was the only show in town, and when the priest became ill, he came to me, and we chatted a little bit, and I thanked him for publicizing my interest in family planning and for the free advertising that he gave me. Obviously, being in practice for so long, you have so many stories of individual experiences, and you have also been active with nonprofit organizations concerned about health, concerned about the environment, concerned about population. I have found recently that the environmental groups have become afraid to discuss population issues or the fact that we're overpopulated because they are afraid of being called racist. Racist and also because of the concerns about coercion. There is well-documented coercion that happened in China, also in India. People were paid or given transistor radios early on in India if they had vasectomies or tubal ligations done. And also in this country, the most recent thing that I've heard about is women having hysterectomies in detention camps. These are people who had crossed the border from Latin America. And indeed, in in California, there were problems of Native folks getting sterilized. My own exposure to this was one woman who had had infertility. She had had three kids, all by cesarean section in Texas, and then came to Colorado and wasn't able to get pregnant. New husband, he checked out fine, but I was the assistant for surgery for infertility. We discovered that her tubes had been tied, evidently with the last C-section done in Texas. This woman told us that she had gone to the doctor in Texas who had said that he didn't really think that her husband at that time was a good husband. And evidently that's why, without her knowledge, tied her tubes. I want to thank you so much for caring about people the environment, making these connections, making them known to the public, 
Thank you very much for being my guest. Boy, it's been my privilege to learn a little bit about what your beliefs are, which are very similar to mine, Nancy. I appreciate your asking me to speak on your show. Thank you. I have been speaking with Dr. Richard Grossman, who is a gynecologist and active with many organizations, and you can read about his work on population-matters.org. I'm Nancy Perlman. Thank you very much for joining us, and do tune in again next week. If you would like free information about these environmental issues, go to www.ecoprojects.org or call 310-559-9160. Environmental Directions with your host, Nancy Perlman, is a community affairs program of the nonprofit organization Educational Communications and this station.